for a heifer uh, replacement heifer management replacement heifer session, we have two speakers. Uh, they are the two newest members of the Beef Revolution Task Force, Dr. Shelby Rosasco from University of Wyoming, and then Dr. Philippe Moriel from University of Florida. And they have done a combined, uh, combined, they have a lot of expertise and experience with uh, heifer development, and we're really excited to have them share some of their work here with you guys. Um, I don't want to take any more time, so Shelby, the floor is yours. Perfect. Can you guys all hear me? Okay. I'm not going to stand up on the stage. You're good back there. Perfect. Um, don't run around. Okay. I will try to stay in one spot. If I start to move around, somebody throws something at me. Okay. <laughs> um, so today, like uh, Vitor said, I'm going to be talking about uh, nutritional strategies for developing replacement heifers and Bos Taurus and Bos Indicus influence beef heifers. Um, so we kind of have this talk split up where I'm going to focus on the Taurus section, uh, which works really well because that's the majority of the research I've done is with the Taurus heifers. Um, and then I'm going to switch over and have Dr. Uh, Philippe Moriel talk about the Bos Indicus influenced heifers. Um, but we do have some overlaps within our topics and some of the development strategies that I'm going to cover today. Uh, so when we start thinking about heifer development, um, I like, kind of like to generalize it a little bit, and that's between Bos Taurus and Bos Indicus influenced heifers. Um, and heifer development is one of my favorite topics. Those um, heifers are, that's really the future of our herd, right? They're an opportunity for us to select and develop um, those next individuals that we're going to have coming up in our herd and hopefully move towards those goals, goals we have. Um, but we also know that they're a major economic investment. And that's whether we're deciding to purchase heifers or we're deciding to retain and develop our own heifers. It takes us a significant amount of time to recoup those development costs that we put in in those first couple years of life because we know they're not going to get ha have a calf for us uh, for several years. Um, and so I think we also need to keep in mind that our heifer development systems are gonna be unique for each operation. So when I was putting this talk together, I really tried to think about how can I give you guys nutritional strategies or development options that can fit a wide variety of different operations throughout the US um, and different goals that you have for your heifers. Now, even though each of our options are gonna be different, um, I do think there's some central questions we can ask ourselves. And that first one is, what makes the best sense for us? Is it to retain and develop our own heifers or is it to purchase heifers? Um, and I'm certainly not going, we could spend the whole time uh, talking about probably and debating whether it's better to retain and develop or to purchase heifers. I'm gonna try to not to make your guys' ear hurt with the, with the speaker over here. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, we're gonna focus on retaining and developing our own heifers and some nutritional strategies there. Um, and then I think we need to think about how do we select the right heifer, right? How do we know when we're looking in that pen of heifers, who's gonna be our most fertile, who's gonna maintain that 365 day calving interval and stay in our herd for a long time. And that's a real challenge we have, but I think we have some opportunities with nutritional management um, to really set these heifers up to be successful and stay in our herd a long time. Uh, and then lastly, um, I won't talk a lot on the economics during this talk, but I do want you guys to be thinking about how long it takes for those heifers to break even. Right, we put a lot of money into these heifers, and depending on the development situation, um, if we're in a lower input system, maybe it's taking us three to five years to break even before those heifers are starting to turn a profit for us, or in some of our higher input systems, maybe that's upwards of eight or nine years. That's some more recent uh, data that's been published that was out of Tennessee. Um, so we do need to be thinking of them almost more like a stalker operation where we're really evaluating the inputs and that's especially important with feed prices that we see recently. Now our whole goal with heifer development is we're trying to build a better cow, right? We're trying to select and build a better cow that's going to be more fertile, that hopefully will give us all better AI pregnancy rates and all of these things that we're within our herd. Um, and so I think it's important to think about 
the pressure that we're placing on these heifers, um, especially within those first couple years of life, because we really have a long to-do list of things that we're asking them to do. Uh, first, we're really, that rate limiting step is that they need to, sorry that it keeps cutting out. <laughs> Uh, we need those heifers to attain puberty, and we want them to attain puberty, hopefully, uh, before the start of that first breeding season. And we know that if we can get those heifers to have at least one, if not two or three cycles before the first breeding season, that we're going to have an opportunity to be more successful and hopefully get those heifers bred early in that first breeding season. And we'll talk about why that's so important here in just a second. We then need them to become pregnant to hopefully calve by two years of age. That's more Taurus centric, right? Our Indicus heifers, that's a little bit more of a challenge. Uh, we also want them to calve without assistance, be able to wean a mark and then to uh, successfully rebreed as a heifer and maintain a 365-day cavern interval. And I think all of those points lead us towards uh, that bottom check mark or bullet point is that we're really trying to maximize lifetime productivity in those heifers, right? We're trying to not only get them to be successful in that first breeding season, we're trying to get them to stay in the herd and uh, perform for us for a long time. So I mentioned that it's important for us to get those heifers bred early in their first breeding season. Um, and VTOR actually kind of showed this data uh, early on this morning. Um, but Dr. Bob Cushman did some work at the U.S. Mean Animal Research Center where they took 16,000 head and they separated them based on when they calved in their first breeding season or in their first calving season. So the green line is those animals that calved in the first 21 days. The black line is those that calved in that second 21 day period. And then that red line is anything that calved greater than 43 days into that first calving season. And what we see here is that those animals that calved um, in that first 21 day period had an increased proportion of animals remaining in the herd over nine calving seasons. And so that's allowing us to keep more of those animals within the herd. So it makes me ask the question of, so how can I use nutritional management or how am I can manage these heifers to hopefully get more of them bred early on so that they stay in the herd longer? And that's gonna make me more money, right? They're staying in the herd, they've recouped their development costs and they start turning a profit for us, right? And that can just be simply that those animals got bred early so they had a longer time to recover before that next breeding season started, right? I don't think, I mean, I'd like to say there's something magical there, but I'm not sure that there's something truly magical happening there. Maybe they're a little bit higher fertility heifers because they were able to get bred earlier or earlier maturing, um, but we do see some advantages there. And the same thing when we follow these same heifers out and look at uh, calf weaning weight on those same heifers, we see that those animals uh, that were, that calved in the first 21 days have an, have an increased, uh, average weaning weight, not only in that first calving season, they have an increased calf weaning weight over the first six calves. And if we actually add up all that additional weaning weight that we see, these animals actually three quarters of a calf more over their lifetime. So not only are they staying in the herd longer, but they're actually producing more pounds of calf over their lifetime for us. So to me, it makes sense to try in our heifers to really select those animals that get bred early. Um, and so I'm going to talk through some nutritional management strategies I think can help us there. Uh, but I think there's an opportunity for us to use ester synchronization and AI to help get these heifers bred early. Uh, maybe some management strategies where uh, we retain extra heifers and only shorten up that breeding season to 45 or 30 days, only keep heifers that are bred on that first cycle. Maybe we keep some additional heifers and at preg check identify those animals that were bred early and then market the rest as bred heifers. I think there's some opportunities for us there uh, to really be able to select those heifers that were bred early who are gonna calve early um, and hopefully have increased longevity um, and increased productivity for us. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time comparing the differences. I think you'll be able to see some differences in, in the Boss Taurus and Boss Indicus heifers um, as I talk through my section and as Dr. Morel talks through his section. Um, but we do know that we're, they're going to exhibit biological differences related to both metabolism as well as reproductive function. Um, and that was something that Mario covered um, earlier in his talk a little bit. Um, but one of the biggest differences in my mind when it comes to heifer development is gonna be puberty attainment between the two. Um, I'm not gonna focus a lot on puberty attainment in my section just because um, I think we've done an exceptional job 
on the Taurus side for selecting for earlier maturing animals. Uh, puberty attainment isn't necessarily as big of a hurdle in our Taurus heifers anymore, as long as we're managing them correctly. I don't think we have um, as big of an issue there. Um, now, if we're starving those heifers down and they're not at the right body condition, that may be a limiting step for us. Um, and it is still something to consider. So when we ask ourselves the question of, can management decisions impact puberty attainment? Um, I think if you've heard any heifer development talk, uh, most of our heifer development research has spent a lot of time focusing on post-weaning development, specifically post-weaning nutritional management of our heifers. Um, and we certainly can see some significant impacts with post-weaning management um, and how that can impact uh, puberty attainment in our heifers. But if we actually start diving into the literature, we see that management before we wean these calves, so earlier on in life, can actually have um, a greater impact on puberty attainment. Now, the challenge there is it's really hard to manage heifers when they're on the cow side, right? They're all mixed in. They're usually in more extensive pastures. That's a bigger challenge for us, but it is an opportunity for us to make sure um, that we're paying attention to those heifers early on in life and making sure that we're helping get them set up to attain puberty in a timely manner. Now, we'll, I'll talk about uh, one study from the pre-weaning time point um, that's really going to highlight that we have some really important developmental windows early in life that we can target nutrition. Um, and so that study is the only one I'm going to talk about that has some Brahmin influence in there, uh, but it's too cool of a study not to talk about. Um, so Cardoso and others in 2014 published some work where they uh, early weaned 40 heifers. So all these heifers were weaned at half months of age, um, and then they were placed on one of four treatments, either a low control, so they were targeted to gain about a pound a day um, over, uh, from about three and a half to 14 months of age, high control, and then two different stair step options. And so that stair step is just altering uh, the rate of gain over that development period. So that stair step one is going to be on a high rate of gain from three and a half to six and a half months, step down to a low, back up to a high, and then a low. And then that stair step two is the reverse sequence. So they started low, then went up to a high, low, high again. Um, and when we look at uh, the body weight performance in these heifers, uh, we do see that those low controls uh, definitely were at a lower body weight uh, throughout the study. Um, but all three of these other treatments ended up at roughly the same body weight at the end of that uh, 14 month, at that 14 months of age time point. And um, we can see some of these different stair steps happening within those stair step treatments where we see periods where those gains are leveling off and then increasing again. Now what's cool is when we look at the puberty attainment, uh, we obviously see that the low controls um, had a really low percentage of heifers uh, attaining puberty, uh, definitely delayed puberty in those heifers by putting them on such a low gain. Um, so even though I said we're not as worried about puberty attainment, I think if we have heifers on too low of a rate of gain and don't get them to an appropriate body and uh, weight, we are going to have some limiting factors there. Um, but when we start to look at uh, the high control and the stair step one treatment, we see a really similar response where uh, the majority of the heifers were pubertal by the time they were 12 months of age. Now, I think that's really cool that we were able to early wean and use these higher rates of gain early on in life between that four to six months of age time point and really hasten puberty. But I would caution you that we don't want precocious puberty, right? That can be really detrimental in our heifers. Um, the cool part of the study to me is really the stair step two because we see they're kind of delayed in attaining puberty. And then we have about 70% of the heifers attain puberty between that 11 and 14 months of age time point, which is really when we want those heifers to be attaining puberty. That gives them an opportunity uh, to cycle one or two times before the start of the breeding season. And what the study shows me is that nutritional uh, management right around that weaning time point, so they were on a higher rate of gain between six to nine months of age, um, had a pretty big impact on them. And so maybe we can utilize nutrition as a way to program when these heifers are going to attain puberty, especially if we know that puberty is maybe an issue um, in our cow herd. So I'll jump to the post-weaning nutritional management because this is certainly an area where we have a lot more control over how we develop our heifers. Um, and so 
Uh, I think if any of you heard a heifer development, probably um, heard about the target body weight approach, right? Where we have this guideline that heifers need to be developed to 60 to 65% mature body weight. And so there was a lot of research in the 1960s through 1980s and even 1990s that really established this guideline. Uh, if we get heifers to that 60 to 65 percent mature body weight, uh, we can maximize pregnancy rates and maximize puberty in these heifers. Um, I think that's uh, a really good and safe mechanism for developing some of our heifers, and it certainly is going to be a good option for a lot of producers, um, but I've spent my entire life on the western half of the U.S., from California, New Mexico, and now Wyoming, where we're in a lot more arid environment. Maybe we don't have the feed resources to push these heifers to that 65%. Um, and certainly, if you've looked at feed prices recently, that 65%, that's going to hurt the pocketbook a little bit more, right? Um, so... In the last uh, one or two decades, we've seen more research come out that really challenged that 65% uh, mature guideline and asked the question of, could we develop heifers to a lower percent mature body weight and still be successful? Um, and they were able to see that, yes, we can develop heifers to a lighter target body weight. So you, most of these studies develop heifers to 50 to 57% mature body weight. Um, and we're able to reduce our development costs sacrificing reproductive performance. Um, and I think this is really important because not only are we decreasing development costs, but I do think it gives us an opportunity to think about adapting heifers to their future production environment. If you go look through most of these studies, they actually take heifers out of the dry lot, develop them out on range, and maybe with these systems, you know, AI pregnancy rates maybe are a little lower or overall pregnancy rates. Um, we have to extend the breeding season or things like that to get similar pregnancy rates. But I think it gives us an opportunity to think about how do I keep the heifers that are going to perform in my environment, right? They're not always going to be in a dry lot at a nice body condition score. And at some point, we're going to put them out on a pasture and we're going to ask them to work for us. So I guess my personal opinion would be I'd rather have the heifers that I know are going to be able to perform in that environment from the get-go. And so when you look through um, quite a bit of this research, um, all three of these studies that are up on that slide um, are from Dr. Rick Funston's group in Nebraska. Um, he's done a lot of this research. And you can see that uh, those heifers on the higher rate of gain, that's the black bars, uh, they're going to have an increase in body weight at the start of the breeding season, which is basically the design of the study and what we would expect. I um, mean, it kind of worries you when you look over here at the percentage of heifers pubertal, and we see some pretty significant differences there. But what's cool is when we look at the overall pregnancy rate in these heifers, we don't see any differences between the low gain or the high gain heifers. Um, in several of these studies, um, the Funston and Dietro study was in both groups in a dry lot, so we're seeing similar performance in a dry lot. The Funston and Larson and the Summer study were both uh, the low gain, those heifers were grazing winter rain, range or a combination of winter range and corn residue. Um, so they're utilizing some cheaper feed resources um, and decreasing the development costs. Um, and actually, if you go look at this summer's and others 2014 study, they actually had an increase in AI pregnancy rates in those heifers. Um, because when they pulled those heifers in to sink them in the dry lot, they actually saw a nice increase in average daily gain and kind of a flushing effect occur in those heifers. Um, and they were better adapted to go back out on range during the breeding season. And they saw a really nice um, increase in AI pregnancy rate in those heifers. So I think there's some for us to take those heifers um, out of the dry lot sometimes if we have the feed resources available and maybe help us select some heifers that are better adapted to our environment. I think it's also really important for us to consider how these different development systems don't just impact pregnancy rates that first year. Um, it's kind of a shortcoming in some of the heifer development literature that we really only look at pregnancy rates that first year. We stop looking at it and we really need to look at what happens long-term to these heifers? Is there a difference in retention rate in these heifers? Um, and so Travis Molinix, who's at Nebraska now, uh, during his graduate program, he did some work in New Mexico uh, where he compared heifers that were either on a 50% RUP diet or a 36% RUP diet grazing native range in New Mexico to heifers developed in the dry lot. And he saw similar performance in the first year as far as puberty attainment, AI pregnancy rates, and overall pregnancy rates. Um, 
But what was really cool is they actually followed these heifers out through four breeding seasons. And what we see is that if we just compare the 50% RUP heifers to the dry lot developed heifers, those 50% RUP heifers actually have an increased percentage of heifers remaining in the herd through that fourth year. Now, I don't really know the mechanism that would be different between the 50 and the 36% RUP heifers, but it certainly makes me question that maybe that 50% RUP group that was developed out grazing native range, maybe they were better adapted to that environment. They knew how to go out and graze and select the quality forage. And if you've been in New Mexico, there's not a lot of forage there, right? So they maybe did a better job. They were more adapted to that environment. And maybe that helped them be able to stay in the herd in the long run. Uh, sorry, RUP is uh, rumen undegradable protein. So these studies, these studies had levels of uh, ruminally undegradable protein. One had 50% and the other had 36% in the diet. So uh, the research that I'm currently working on is based on uh, some stair-step development systems. Um, and so I think uh, some of these older studies, so this Lynch study in 1997 was one of the first ones that really looked at the influence of timing of gain. Um, so not only uh, do we have an option to maybe put them on a lower rate of gain, maybe we can alter the timing of gain. Maybe they don't, they don't need to be on a consistent rate of gain over the entire development period. Um, and so in this study, they had two treatments. They had heifers on an even rate of gain or on a late gain system where uh, the first part of the development period, they were on a relatively uh, slow pattern of gain, and then they were stepped up the last 45 to 60 days. Um, and what was really cool was they saw no difference in pregnancy rates in those heifers. They had some uh, slight increases in AI pregnancy rates in one of the years of the study, um, and that they also speculated, they didn't actually calculate development costs, but they speculated that they may have decreased development costs because when we utilize this low high system, we actually enact this concept of compensatory gain, where those heifers more efficiently gain after they've been on a period of restriction. And so they're more efficiently utilizing the feed resources available to them. And so we've seen several studies follow this up. Um, and when we look at heifer pregnancy rate in all of these different systems that use uh, somewhat of a similar low high system, there's differences in timing and there's differences in how these heifers were fed, we see that there's no differences in pregnancy rates. And so we have an opportunity there to maybe more efficiently uh, feed these heifers. Um, I think about this when I'm in Wyoming because winters are a little harsh there. Pouring the feed to them to keep them on a constant rate of gain requires more feed because we're in a harsher environment. So maybe delaying that gain to when things eventually do warm up there, uh, when things warm up, maybe we can be more efficient with how we're feeding these heifers and more cost efficient with how we develop them as well. Now, some of the stuff that I'm working on and that excites me the most actually looks at um, not just pregnancy rates in these heifers, but we're trying to look these uh, stair step development systems actually impact uh, the number of microscopic follicles or the ovarian reserve in these heifers. So when I refer to the ovarian reserve, um, I'm specifically for referring to the number of primordial follicles uh, that are formed during gestation in, uh, in our cattle. And so you can see there up on the slide, uh, that smallest size of follicle, that's our primordial follicle. Uh, we can't see those unless we take the ovaries out and put them on the microscope slides. Um, but we know that the size of the ovarian reserve uh, can positively correlate with fertility. And so if we have a larger ovarian reserve is, the theory is that we would have a potential increase in longevity, which would make sense, right? More primordial follicles, more eggs that they would potentially have to utilize over their lifetime. And so there's been several studies that have looked at how these stair step or these low high systems actually impact uh, the ovarian reserve. The first one of these in cattle was done at the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center in Nebraska uh, by Dr. Harvey Freetling and Dr. Bob Cushman, um, and they were able to, sorry about that, uh, they were able to see a significant increase in the number of primordial or microscopic follicles in those animals that were fed on that stair step or low high system. Um, and so this was really unique because we originally thought that that number of primordial follicles that was fed at birth 
they, de they decline at a constant rate over their lifetime and nothing that we do is gonna impact that. And this study really challenged that and let us see that maybe nutrition early on in that heifer's life can actually have a positive impact on the ovarian reserve and maybe longevity in these heifers. They followed this study up with another one by Amundsen and others in uh, 2015, uh, where they actually looked at the timing to look at specifically when did this increase in the ovarian reserve happen. And so uh, these heifers were in the dry lot. They were on the stair step heifers were on a low rate of gain from eight to 11 months of age, then stepped up to a higher rate of gain from 11 to 13 months of age. And we see uh, those primordial follicles numbers per section are the size of the ovarian reserve is similar between at both eight months of age, which is initiation, um, and 11 months of age. But by 13 months of age, we see this nice increase in the number of primordial follicles. And there's, again, nice increase in the size of the ovarian reserve. So again, it has this question, are we maybe slowing the rate of depletion of these follicles? And we really think that maybe that uh, eight to 11 months of age time point, maybe we're slowing the rate there and we don't necessarily see an increase at this specific 11 month time point, but by the time they're 13 months, we're seeing that nice increase occur. So I did some research in my PhD where we followed this up um, because I really had the question of, okay, that's great. We can do this in the dry lot but there's a lot of operations that don't develop heifers in the dry lot. Is this still an opportunity for them to get this increase in the size of the ovarian reserve um, in heifers grazing native range? And so uh, we conducted this project in Corona, New Mexico at the research center there. Uh, I had 40 heifers that were individually fed or individually supplemented. They were either on a uh, constant gain dry lot, stair step dry lot, constant gain native range or stair step native range treatment for a little bit shorter development period than what Freetley and Amundsen used previously uh, with only 90 days. Um, and you can kind of see here that those treatments depicted. Um, and what was really interesting was that the heifers did not do what we wanted, <laughs> right? The range heifers definitely didn't do follow what they were supposed to do. So when we look at the effects of uh, the stair step system on heifer body weight and performance, um, the only time we had good control was initiation, right? Um, so they were all similar body weights at initiation. They were supposed to be similar body weights the majority of the study. We weren't looking for big differences in body weight, just differences in rates of gain over time. But those native range heifers had a significant increase in average daily gain and a significant increase in body weight by day 45. And this continued all the way through the end of the study. Um, and part of that was we have no control over intake of grass when they're out grazing native forage. So despite my best efforts of changing supplement rates and uh, individually supplementing all these heifers, they kind of did what they wanted. And we had a really nice green up that year in New Mexico, which is kind of weird. <laughs> and um, we saw that they had a significantly greater body weight throughout. And this may have had some impact when we looked at some of the other uh, fertility measures. Again, we took ovaries out in these heifers at the end, so I have no pregnancy rates or anything like that. Um, but we did look at dominant follicle diameter when we took those ovaries out, and we saw a significant increase in the size of the dominant follicle diameter in our native range development compared to uh, the dry lot developed heifers. Uh, now, I do think it's important to note that we certainly weren't limiting fertility in these. Uh, we know that bovine follicles obtain ovulatory capacity between seven and 10 millimeters in diameter. Uh, so I don't think we were limiting fertility in those dry lot heifers, um, but maybe we were increasing fertility in the, the range heifers because they were a little bit better conditioned. They had a little bit better average daily gain due to that nice green up. Uh, we also looked at follicular fluid hormone concentrations, um, and we saw a significant increase in the uh, estradiol concentrations within the dominant fo follicle follicular fluid. Um, again, that's a really good thing. Uh, we know that a higher concentration of estrogen is a positive thing from a fertility standpoint. Um, but when we looked at the 
ratio of estradiol to progesterone. And this is where we want a ratio greater than one. Again, on average, we have that greater than one ratio in all of our treatments. So I don't think that the dry lot limited fertility in these heifers, um, but maybe that native range, that nice green up, the stair step they had, uh, maybe that was a positive impact. So maybe in certain situations, grazing those heifers on native range can positively impact fertility in these heifers. Now, when we looked at the size of the ovarian reserve or primordial follicle numbers, um, we were able to see uh, similar results to Freetley and Amundsen, where we see a nice increase in the size of the ovarian reserve or the number of primordial follicles in those stair step dry lot, as well as the stair step native range treatment compared to the constant gain dry lot heifers. Uh, now, what was interesting was the constant gain uh, native range heifers were similar to all other treatments. So we were really excited because we saw, okay, not only can we do this stair step system out or in the dry lot, we can also do this out on range, um, but it did have us question that maybe those constant gain native range heifers, if you think back to the body weight performance, they kind of followed that same stair step pattern. Now they were still to the best of my ability getting supplemented to try to be on a constant rate of gain. So nutrient intake from the supplement was different, but maybe that natural green up caused this nice stair step effect regardless. Um, and so maybe there's an opportunity there uh, for us to develop these heifers on range and still be really successful with fertility. Um, and we do think that maybe this increase in the number of primordial follicles, uh, whether they're in the dry lot or on native range may result in an increase in longevity. Now, the next step is obviously for me to stop taking ovaries out of heifers, leave some ovaries in, breed them, and actually follow these heifers out. And what's really a good thing is they already did some of this work um, in Nebraska at the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center. So last year, Dr. Freetley published a study uh, where they looked at um, 600 heifers, so 300 constant gain versus 300 stair step heifers. Uh, they actually left ovaries in, bred them, have followed them out, and they were able to see um, that we have an increased percentage of heifers remaining in the herd or still calving through six years of age. And so this gives us some good hope that maybe that stair step system um, actually is improving longevity. Maybe it's improving fertility in these heifers. And maybe it's an opportunity for us to not only be more efficient with how we develop them, but an opportunity to increase fertility and longevity in these heifers. So kind of to wrap up the stair step nutritional part, um, when we actually look through uh, all three or four of these studies, we see that we have no difference in the percentage of heifers pubertal by what would be the start of the breeding season. We had no differences in antral follicle count, as well as no differences in date of, date of conception as a heifer in that last Freetly study I showed you. Um, and so we're not seeing big differences in fertility right off the bat, but we are seeing that increase, potential increase in longevity. Um, and so it does kind of raise the question for us, if, if fertility is improved, what could be the mechanisms controlling this? Um, and so I was really hoping to have some data to show you guys today from the current study that I'm running, but it's just not quite there yet. Um, so hopefully next year, maybe I'll have something else to show you guys. Um, but we're repeating this study in Wyoming, but we're actually looking at uh, progesterone concentrations as a way to see if there's any differences in progesterone concentrations. Um, and we're also taking uterine biopsies to look at uterine function and see if there's any differences um, between these treatment groups as far as that. Um, and eventually I will leave some ovaries in and follow these heifers out and do some more of that type of work as well. Um, so the other thing I wanna briefly talk about is uh, kind of ask you guys the question of, is there a way for us to add value or increase efficiency in our replacement heifer system? Um, certainly, we've talked through several of the really common nutritional strategies, um, and that the stair step system really um, excites me about the possibilities there, but is there opportunities for us to be more economically efficient? Uh, and so a little bit controversial, we'll talk about growth running implants for a minute. Um, and so nobody run me off the stage, okay? <laughs> um, I think growth promoting implants are a unique opportunity for us. And so um, I think we've all probably heard the recommendation that if you know you're gonna keep a heifer, you shouldn't use a growth promoting implant. Um, and I would totally agree with that. If you know for sure you're keeping that heifer, there's no sense in uh, utilizing an implant, we're not gonna gain a lot from that. But we had a lot of producers ask when I was in New Mexico, is it really true? 
that implant really impact negatively impact fertility? And is there an opportunity for me to use this, um, especially in drought years, years where I'm not sure if I'm going to keep all my calves or all those heifers? Is there an opportunity for me to get uh, more body weight out of these heifers and maybe get a little bit increase in profit out of these heifers? Um, so we went back to try to answer this. Um, and so we took uh, three or four years of heifers uh, where we um, had controls that were non-implanted or implanted, and those heifers received a single Cinevexy implant at two to three months of age at branding. So every other heifer that came through the shoot at branding was implanted, um, and then we followed these heifers out. And so saw was those implanted heifers had a nice increase in body weight at weaning. Um, and so at that time point, maybe drought conditions are still bad, we have an opportunity to have that increase in body weight and maybe an increase in profitability of those heifers if we're selling them. Now, if things turn around, we still have the question of what does that do to fertility? When we followed the body weight out, we actually saw that that body weight advantage was maintained through the yearling time point as well as through the start of the breeding season. Um, they were managed the same. There wasn't any differences in nutrition. They all ran together as a group. Um, so it was kind of cool to see that that increase in body weight at weaning was maintained uh, through the start of that first breeding season. Now, when we looked at the impact of these Cinevex C implants um, on reproductive performance, specifically pregnancy rates, because that's generally been the biggest question, uh, we actually saw no statistical difference in first service conception rate between these heifers, and we had no difference in overall pregnancy rates with a 60-day breeding season um, in these heifers. And so we were really excited by this, but it still raised the question for us of, okay, nothing happened that first year. What happens long-term? Is there any impact in the long run? Maybe they're fine that first year, uh, but that implant impacts uh, their ability to stay in the herd. We've started to follow these heifers out. Um, and this is still some preliminary data. We've still been adding to this over time. This paper's not completely published yet. Um, but what we're able to see in the preliminary data is that we have no difference in the heifers that are remaining in the herd um, through five years of age, which is really exciting to us that these heifers uh, don't seem to be having really long-term detrimental effects. Now, I think there's still work, some work to be done uh, for us to continue to follow these out. We actually did OVEXs on a different set of these heifers, um, and we're able to see no differences in the size of the ovarian reserve between these, um, but we have plans as well to continue on and look at how this impacts uterine function as well, um, because we really want to be sure when we tell you guys that the growth brain implants are okay, that they really are okay. But I do think this is a good opportunity, especially for those producers in uh, drought areas or producers that aren't always heifers going to be able to keep uh, for them to maybe get some more profit out of those heifers when they sell them at that weaning time point. Now, the last thing I want to talk about before I turn things over to uh, Dr. Morial is uh, post-breeding nutritional management. Um, and if you guys have been to this meeting before or watched any of our webinars, I think we talk about this quite a bit. Um, but I think sometimes in heifers, uh, we think a lot about the post-weaning or pre-breeding development period. We get really excited about how we're going to manage these heifers. Um, and then sometimes we kind of forget to continue that nutritional management uh, into that breeding season. Um, and like Vitor kind of said this morning, fertility is not just a one-time event, right? Several of the AI reps and everybody kind of talked about the fact that you have to consistently think about fertility. And that means thinking about nutrition and management during the breeding season as well. Um, and so we know that alterations in plane of nutrition post-breeding um, can alter conception rates as well as embryo quality. Um, and there's certainly a lot of data out there, especially from uh, Dr. George Perry's lab that covers this. Um, some of these studies looked at uh, specifically post i nutrition. Um, this specific study was, study was done in the dry lot, and they looked at heifers on three rates of gain post-AI, um, either to gain weight, that's the black bars, to maintain weight, that's going to be gray, or lose weight. And what we see is those heifers that are maintained on a positive plane of nutrition have an increase in first service conception rates. Again, we were when we maintained that plane of nutrition, kept them on a positive plane of nutrition as a heifer, we were able to see better AI success. Uh, George Perry did some other research where um, he developed heifers either on range 
that's the black bars, or in the dry lot. They were both developed to 65% mature body weight. Uh, we see a similar proportion of heifers pubertal at the start of the breeding season. Uh, but what was really interesting was after AI, the pasture heifers were back on pasture, but the dry lot heifers were moved out to range. And we see a 10% reduction in AI conception rates there. Um, and a big part of that is think about the change in nutrition and nutrient intake that these heifers have during that time point. They're in a dry lot where it's, they haven't been grazing for probably months at a time. And um, we know that grazing is a learned behavior. So when we put them back on the, out on pasture, um, what's the first thing they do, right? They go circle the pasture. They're trying to figure out where everything is in the pasture. They're not thinking about eating and they're not used to that diet. So there's a transition period there. Now he's done some follow-up research um, that has shown that supplementation of heifers when we move them from the dry lot out to pasture can help alleviate that. Uh, it's gonna provide the necessary nutrient intake to reduce uh, those decreases in conception rates that we see. Um, so kind of going back, hopefully you guys have seen, I've talked a little bit about the long-term impacts. Um, I've kind of hit home on that because I think that's really important. We get wrapped up in that single season and we need to look over time how these heifers perform, be able to decide what's best for our operation. Um, but that's a hard thing to do, right? One, it's hard from a research standpoint to continue to follow heifers out and manage them the same. But it's also hard because we know uh, that there's a big influence of the environment as well as management throughout their lifetime. We also know that longevity and reproduction have relatively low heritability, right? It's hard for us to continually select for longevity or reproduction and see really fast results. But I do think, hopefully I've shown you guys that some of these management strategies, especially early on in life, can have a pretty significant impact on longevity, as well as uh, retention of those animals within the cow herd and provide us with some opportunities to use management to influence longevity. So kind of just to summarize, and then I'll turn the floor over uh, to Dr. Moriel. Um, Heifer selection and development is unique for each operation. So I certainly, uh, when I talk with producers, never tell them you have to develop heifers to 60% in the dry lot. That's the only way. I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to develop heifers um, in a lot of different settings, depending on what you have available for your operation. I also think um, understanding the impacts of nutrition on fertility and specifically puberty attainment, fertility that first breeding season as well as long-term is gonna be important. That steer step nutritional program, I know I've touted it a lot. Um, I'm really excited about it because I think it gives us a lot of really great and unique opportunities uh, to maybe positively influence longevity with nutrition. Um, and then be consistent. I think that's been kind of a echoed across all the talks today is consistency is key when it comes to thinking about fertility and reproduction. Um, and then lastly, uh, those growth planning implants are maybe an opportunity um, in some of our different production settings. So my contact information is up there. Um, I think we'll just kind of transition over and then we can do questions at the end. Um, but if you guys have any burning questions while we switch, I'm happy to answer any of those. Thanks. Thank you, Shelby. Uh, can you guys hear me well? There? Okay. So while they're transitioning the slides, uh, my name is Philippe Moriel. I am an associate professor in University of Florida. So I did my master's at Wyoming, then went to Florida for a PhD, and then went to North Carolina, where I did, I worked as a faculty over there for two years, and then 2016, I'm back to, to Florida. So a lot of the things that we do actually study is uh, nutrition for beef females, replacement heifers, pregnant cows, mature cows, first calf cows, okay? So a lot of what I'm gonna show is what we have done in our center. So now we're gonna switch gears and talk just about balsinicus. Okay, there's some overlap with what uh, Shelby just showed it to you. Okay, but I'm going to show you, did it work or did it not work with Bosinicus influence hackers? Now, also, everything that I'm going to show today here is just for if you're deciding to breed those heifers at 12 to 14 months of age. We still have a good percentage of producers in Florida that prefer that they care for the first time as a three-year-old. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It just fits their system. It works for them. They're happy with it. So nothing wrong with that. So everything that I'm saying now is if you really want to push them. Now, Shelby Ray said, we all know that, that those heifers, they, they tend to reach puberty to a much older age. 
right? So not sometimes not that much old, but still. So if we don't do any, something right, right? If we just delay a little bit of their growth, we can have a drastic impact on their reproductive performance. So for example, Victor, uh, can you click on the PowerPoint again, please? Okay, yeah. So this is uh, two studies that we did in Florida for two years, all Brangus heifers developed on pasture. Okay, we applied different treatments, but at the end of the study, we looked at what's the difference in the performance of heifers that achieved puberty before the breeding season compared to those that achieved puberty during the breeding season. So 100% of those heifers had at least one opportunity to get bred. Right? So they all achieved puberty. Now look at the difference on their final pregnancy rates. This is final, okay? If they achieve puberty during the breeding season or before, during or before, and look at the cabin distribution as well, right? So it, even if they do reach puberty before the end of the breeding season, the time is important. So developing those efforts to make sure that they achieve puberty before the start of the breeding season is very important for those bocinicus influence heifers. So what I'm gonna to talk today is a little bit, I'm gonna be very, there's a lot of things to talk, so I'm gonna be straight to the point, right? And we can discuss it later. So let's first talk about post weaning gain. So obviously, if you feed them, they grow more, they will do better, right? So these are heifers, Brangus heifers, right? They're fall calving, so we, uh, we normally wean them at nine months of age, eight to nine months of age in July. We don't want pasture, and then we develop them all the way until March, okay, bring season from December to March. Now, these levels of supplement for some of you might be really high, but it's, it's needed in our place. Anything less, as I'm going to show you later, anything less than this, it doesn't work. They will not gain uh, more than a pound uh, a day, and maybe sometimes, sometimes even less than that. So we really have to push those efforts. And again, if you feed them enough, they will grow more. More heifers reach puberty, more heifers got pregnant, and more heifers got pregnant early, which we guys already seen that they do tend to stay longer in the herd when they're bred early. Now, what about target body weights? Uh, Shelby said that in most indicus, people usually have these traditional guidelines of 65% of their target body weight at the start of the breeding season. So as I'm going to show you, that actually hasn't changed much. So these are a summary of all the studies that we have done at the center with Borbrangus heifers, again, on pasture, being supplemented, where we have here, the, we have studies highlighted in, in, in white, are studies that we did not use any puberty induction or ester synchronization protocol. The ones at the bottom we did use uh, different types of uh, ester uh, synchronization or puberty induction protocol, okay? Now, look at this. this the, here we have the study, the type of supplement and the amount, how much they gain, Look at that. This is 1% of their body weight. Sometimes they gain uh, 0.6 pounds a day. This is horrible. Now, the mature body weight at the start of the breeding season, their final pregnancy rates. So with a few exceptions, as you guys can see, we do not, if, if they're developed at a body weight less than 60% at the start of the breeding season, we do not get pregnancy rates higher than 70%. All right? With no protocol. Now, if they do, oh, I'm sorry, if they are developed to feed close to 70% or it's above 65% of the body weight, that's where we start seeing huge increments in pregnancy. And this is not using any protocol. So it seems that it hasn't changed much, at least for the Boston, because of the traditional guidelines. Even though Shell mentioned that with Boston heifers, you might be able to push them, develop up to 55, would be the Boston because it will not work. Uh, when you implement a protocol, we were actually able to lower that a little bit in average is 60%, all right? But still, those heifers had to be developed enough around 60% of their body weight. So this is very similar to some of the data we have seen in Australia, right? So boss indicus influenced animals, like Brangus crossbreds, for example, they need 65% if they're not synchronized, close to 60 if you use a protocol. Is it gonna be worth every year? I don't know, it depends on where you are, depends on the year, the cost of feed and so on. So I don't have a, a perfect answer for you. Now, what about if you have more bocinicus blood? Now, this is a study that was done in Brazil, Nelor, 100% Nelor, or half Nelor, half Angus, like Vitor showed you at the beginning. And they wanted to breed those heifers at 12 months of age, okay? So develop them to achieve 660 uh, pounds at the start of the puberty induction protocol. So that's about 65% of their mature body weight, 
And then they use two consecutive asset synchronization protocols and timed AI. So pregnancy rates as heifers, 80% for those half and lower half uh, Angus, only 60% for those that are in the lower half, it's 100%. And again, they're developed at 65. There are some studies showing that you actually need to be 70 in this case to breed a little bit better than that. So we have to feed, there's no other choice. Now, this pregnancy rates is actually quite good if you compare it to the same type of heifer that was actually left on pasture and they let them, allow them to breed only as two-year-olds. So they kept the first time as three-year-olds, all right? So it is possible. Now, these heifers here that we pushed a little bit more at the beginning, when they become first calf counts, if they provide supplementation during the first three months after postpartum, they rebred at 80% as first calf counts. But if you don't only provide grass, if you don't provide enough nutrition, they're gonna do very poorly too, as most people do. So it seems that overall, nothing really has changed, right? We still have the traditional guidelines, 65% is a good target, unless you're using a synchronization protocol in crossbred heifers, all right? We could stay all day talking about this, but I'm gonna, I wanna show you a little bit more of other things that we can do. So having said that, we know that we had to develop those heifers and usually it's for a long time. We're talking about six months or more. So it's a long time to feed those heifers, okay? So not a lot of people have time for that or resources to do it. So one thing that we can try to do it to help people minimize labor and make more efficient of their time is decreasing the frequency of supplementation. So this is quite common in places that are more extensive, right? So for example, instead of providing three pounds of a uh, concentrate per day, that's 21 pounds in a week, what you do is just divide the weekly amount by the number of days you wanna feed, and that's how much you're gonna provide. So for example, seven pounds on Monday, seven pounds on Wednesday, seven pounds on Friday. Cutting labor by half, but you're still providing the same amount of weekly supplement on grass. Okay, but what are the implications of that? So think about forage intake first. Think about an animal that is being supplemented every day with the same amount of, of energy or protein supplement. You expect their forage intake to be quite consistent over that week. Now think about the animal that now is being supplemented three times a week. So instead of getting three pounds, like I showed you, now he's getting seven. It's more than double what he usually normally see. So that's when the forage intake is gonna go down. The next day, you don't provide supplement, forage intake is gonna go up, usually higher than the other group. What does that do to their body? So it causes fluctuations in total energy and protein intake. And that leads to differences in the release of hormones and metabolites that are associated with reproduction. So for example, when we look at glucose, non-certified fatty acids, IGF-1, all related to purity attainment, pregnancy rates, maternal recognition of pregnancy. Okay, we don't have to go into details. Look at the ones that are supplemented daily. It's quite consistent throughout the week. Now, if they're supplemented three times a week, you're gonna see these peaks of hormones and um, uh, metabolites released because of that fluctuation in nutrient intake. Now, what's the implication of that? Well, sometimes it doesn't affect their growth. They are gonna have the same average daily, you know, average daily gain, but look at their purity attainment. Those heifers are supplemented three times a weekly, significantly less heifers achieve purity if they were supplemented three times a week. There's no differences in average daily gain, age or body weight in this study for the entire study. So somehow this fluctuations in nutrient consumption maybe uh, fools their brain to believe that they're not ready for puberty attainment. So even though they have the age and the body weight necessary for that. Now, we try different combinations. We try using less supplement, more supplement, trying to play with that. Okay, so one of the next one study that we completed recently is this one. We looked at uh, two amounts of feed and then within each amount, we provide it two times a week or daily, okay? So 1.25 or 175. This is the minimum that we have to provide. And this is a, a much larger amount, okay? And in this study, oh, something I forgot to mention. The study that I showed you before, we did not use any protocol, okay? So they're just natural services on those efforts. In this one, we implemented this protocol here with the idea that maybe by implementing a protocol, I could eliminate the differences in puberty attainment, and then there would be no problem with their reproductive performance. Okay, so what I can tell you that didn't work. Not the amount of supplement didn't do anything, and the protocol helped just a little bit, but didn't fix the problem. 
So overall in this study here, when they were supplementing three times a week, they actually gained less, slightly less, right? We didn't see it now. Look at the start of the, uh, the SR synchronization protocol. There's a 13% difference in purity attainment. After the protocol, it goes down to six, still statistical significant, all right? So it helped, but it didn't eliminate the problem 100%. Now, if I kept feeding those heifers on three times a week all until the end of the breeding season, that difference uh, uh, goes back to 13%, right? So the protocol helped a little bit, but then if you kept feeding three times a week, it's just not gonna, not, it was not good. Didn't hurt the overall pregnancy rates, but at least, it also, but at least it's uh, delayed calving distribution of those heifers. So implementing the protocol uh, did something, but not enough. Now, when you look at the, all the studies that we've done with frequency, uh, just to guys, so you guys have a, a key message for this, when we look at all four studies and we look at average daily gain, three or four studies show that it actually decreases the gain if you supplement three times a week. When it did not decrease, when forage quality is extremely low, then there's no problem. Usually when you decrease the frequency, they're gonna eat about half of a kilo or about a pound less of forage per day in average. Now, if it's low quality grass, that one pound won't do a difference. But if it's good grass, you can make a difference over the long term, right? So in here, most of the time we decrease. Three of those studies, we decrease their puberty attainment. One of them, we decrease pregnancy rates and the other one, we delay calving. So still, we haven't been able to figure out what to do with those efforts to try to allow producers to feed less frequently without seeing those negative impacts. Okay, so if you're developing heifers, I don't have very good news for you, at least in frequency supplementation yet. I mean, perhaps we're gonna keep trying something else and maybe we'll find something that will work. Now, another one, this third step, you guys heard a lot about it. Now, this is a little bit different than what uh, Shelby was showing, okay? This is more trying to match the environment. We did it at a much older age. We started at around nine months of age and we only fed them for about a hundred days. And our idea was to match the challenges of the environment and not necessarily uh, anything else, okay? So for example, this is a situation that we have in Southeast for people that have fall calving hurts. You're gonna win them around June, July, and you have to develop them in these conditions. Plenty of grass, but not very good quality. A lot of water, very hot, so those heifers don't gain. Sometimes July, August, so those heifers will gain two to three times less than what you predicted. Very challenging. So if I slow down their growth during the summer, that means that they have to really catch up at the end so they don't get affected, right? When they're gonna reach puberty. So let, just to put it into numbers, we know it's hot in Southeast, we know it's hot in Florida, but how hot is that? So this is the THI, right? The thermal humidity index, that it's a level indicating how hot it is, how heat stress those animals are experiencing. This is the average of the day. This is the lowest THI observed during the day. And this is the highest one, okay? So all the way from August, all the way to November. So in average, we are exposed to at least heat stress for all the way to November. And for several hours of the day, they experience severe heat stress on those animals, okay? Especially at the beginning here in the first uh, 50, 60 days. So what we wanted to do was to implement this stair step strategy, trying to help with that. So think of an animal that is heat stressed. One, there are several things that happen to the body. The first one, one of the first mechanisms that the animal changes to adapt to the environment, even though they are bosinicus, okay? They're not bulletproof. They still suffer a little bit with the heat, not as much as bostaros, but they still do. Those changes in behavior physiology happens in both of them. Now, one of the first things they would do is lower intake. So because they decrease the intake, every time you eat, there's heat production. So now you're producing heat in your body, you're just making it harder to control internal temperature. So one of the first things that the animal does, I mean, I'm gonna pull off feed, so I produce less heat and I can't able to handle the, the, the temperatures, right? Now, so what we wanted to do here is, well, can we actually implement this stair step where we provide a lower amount of supplement during the beginning when it's really hot, THI is really high. And then at the end, when it's a little bit cooler, and drier, that's when we push them, all right? We, whatever we saved in the first half, we pushed all the way towards the end. Will that work? We're not looking at trying to save feed, as Shelby was saying, right? That they're more efficient, they eat 10% less when you do the stair step. Here, I'm just trying to escape the, the hot weather. Um, whatever I'm saving here, the first 50 days, I'm gonna provide at the end. So we did for two years. 
This is a study that was funded by the Calum Association, so we thank them for that. So we had the control group that we feed at one and a half percent of their body weight with concentrate for 100 days, okay, before uh, the breeding season. And then we had the third step where we provided about 1% for the first 50 days. Then we increased to 2% uh, on the next 50 days. And then we synchronized those heifers, AI, time AI, I'm sorry, synchronized the time AI and put the bulls with them. And then we fed uh, high concentrate at one and a half percent all the way to the end of the breeding season. All right, so the only difference is how we fed them the first 50 days, the, the first, I'm sorry, 100 days of developing period. So what we seen was the first 50 days when it's really hot, you guys can see here the THI during the day. Look at the average daily gain of those two heifers. The control is fed at one and a half percent of their body weight with concentrate. The stair step at 1%. So the control is getting 50% more feed, right, compared to the stair step, where half percent of their body weight more, but even though they're getting more feed, they're not turning into growth. And the reason is this, look at their internal uh, intravaginal temperature, okay? We feed them at around eight o'clock, start getting really hot. Those that, are, that will consume more supplement, they reach a higher body temperature much sooner and stays longer than the other animals. So what we believe is happening here is that the extra amount of feed is just being wasted those animals trying to handle the temperature, right? Trying to, and they're just wasting that energy. Instead of going to growth, they are just using it to try to lower their body temperature. Now, what about the next 50 days? Now, it's a little bit cooler. You guys can see, look at the, the, the THI line here. I'm sorry, oh my God. Look at the THI line here, is the dash line. Look at the first 50 days. Second 50 days, right? It's not that much, if you, uh, but it helps a lot of those efforts. Now here, the stair step is getting 2% of their body weight and the control is still fed at one and a half. So now these heifers are eating half a percent more. But look at the average daily gain. So this is not just the compensatory goal, growth because now, because the environment is much cooler, the extra amount of feed is not affecting their internal body temperature. So the extra feed is actually being used for growth rather than being wasted. So when we look at overall average daily gain of those heifers over the 100 day period, those that were supplemented uh, on the stair step strategy, they gain more, even though the total amount of supplement is exactly the same. So for 100 days at the start of the synchronization protocol, those heifers are slightly heavier. We didn't see any differences in purity attainment on that study, which is also a little bit surprising. No differences in the reproductive tract score, no differences in heifers showing in asterisks, but look at the final pregnancy rates. So it worked, it worked perfectly in our situation. Just trying, playing with the amount of feed and matching the, what the environment is challenging those heifers, it, it works. Now, is that risky? Absolutely, right? Because what's the matter, what's the problem here? If you slow down their growth at the beginning too much, you might not have time enough to catch up. Or if they don't gain enough in the second half, you might not, they might not catch up enough. But if everything goes right, it helps. And then pregnancy rates is very, very high. We were very happy with those results. And this is two years, okay? It's not just one year. Now, what about, I'm gonna show you some of the things that we can actually do to tweak their reproductive axis. Okay, is there something, we're always trying to be more efficient. And, and uh, so the next two, things that I'm going to talk about is one way to do that. All right. So Shelby already mentioned to you that nutrition during the pre-weaning phase is more important than the post-weaning. And that's absolutely true for any subspecies. All right. Now, what we, a good example to, a good model to understand. So yeah, this is a metabolic, people call metabolic king printing. Okay. This is started with humans. They wanted to understand what happened with the nutrition of babies and how does that relate to their disorders right later in life and same thing happens with every single animal so it's the idea that by changing the nutrition during early few months after birth can actually change how their reproductive axis develop or other tissues and that has long-term effects okay so a good model to to study this is the early weaning so dr day did with boss status efforts several years ago that he looked at the stage of puberty attainment okay you have the infantile developmental static in the peripubertal phase. Okay, this is Bostel's. And he showed that when you actually feed those heifers between two to six months of age, high energy diets, you can actually eliminate the second, the third phase. 
So those heifers start achieving puberty too much sooner. Now, does it work with both syndicals heifers? So that's what we did in Florida. One of the strategies that we do to increase pregnancy rates of our first calf cows is to early wean their calves on the first day of their breeding season. So we put them, we early wean those calves at two to three months of age, and then we put them with the bulls, all right? And now we have those calves that you guys are seeing in the picture that we have, we, we have to develop them, right? So this study, this is a study that I did for my PhD. So it's two years. So those are half, all heifers, okay, Brangos heifers, that we assign them to four combinations of treatments, okay? The first one, they stay with the cows, right? We didn't already wean, and we normally wean those heifers just at eight to nine months of age, okay? Just a, the conventional management practice. And then we had three early weaning treatments. The first one, we early wean at two to three months. Then we put them in a high concentrate diet in the feedlot for six months. Then we had a third group that we early weaned in January, two to three months of age, and they were in a high concentrate diet in the feedlot for just three months. Just during that window that I showed you that is critical for the reproductive access, all right, between two to six months. And after that, we put them back on pasture to try to reduce cost. The idea here, this is our imprinting treatment, right? Did it, is it going to work or not? And then we have the final treatment, which is you early wean them and you put them on pasture with supplement the whole time. So all four possible combinations to make everybody happy. Now, after nine months of age, we develop them, everybody the same, everybody on pasture, everybody receiving the same amount of concentrate all the way to the end of the breeding season. No protocol, just natural service in here. So what did we see? So after two years, this is the growth of those heifers in the first three months. Again, the ones that are early weaned and put on a high concentrate diet, obviously they're much heavier, right? Compared to those that remain with the mother or were early weaned and stayed on pasture as you would expect. What happened in the next three months? So from six to nine months of age, the ones that were early weaned and stayed on the feedlot the whole time, the ones in orange, okay? So obviously they're gonna be the heaviest. Look at the ones that were early weaned and stayed on pasture. They're the lightest at nine months of age. Look at this one here, right? The ones that stayed in the feedlot for just three months compared to those that remain with the mother. It's exactly the same by the way by the time we normal wean the control group. And then after that, we fed everybody the same. So the differences among those treatments remained all the way into the end. Now, what happened, to, remember this, okay? This data here, exactly the same by UA by nine months of age and no differences after that. Now, what happened to the puberty attainment? So those that were early weaned and weren't on feedlot for nine months, I'm sorry, for six months, 100% of those heifers reached puberty before the start of breeding season, compared to those that were early weaned and stayed on pasture, only about 40% of them. Now look at the ones that were with the mothers. Okay, this is quite common. Heifers, they are weaned here in July, only about 30, 40% of them cycling at the beginning of the breeding season if they stayed with the mother. But look at the ones that were in the feedlot for just three months. Even though they had the same body weight, same age, same average daily gain from July all the way to February compared to the ones that were with the mothers, 80% of them were cycling. And the pregnancy rates follow the same trend. So it works, right? So in both syndicates, it can work very well. Now, honestly, nobody's gonna early wean calves just to develop those heifers. You have to look at the whole system because obviously it's not gonna pay off if you just account for how much feed they consume. Now we do early weaning for all of our first calf counts and that increased their pregnancy rates by 30%. It goes from 60 to 95%. So when you look at the whole system, the benefits to the mother and what happens to the heifers that you retain he does pay off in that situation, but, right? but we can talk more about that a little, in a little bit. Now, another one that is more recent, and this is, we still are collecting more data on that type of strategy. So it's quite early to draw major conclusions, but I just wanna show you some, some of the results that are quite exciting. So now we have this concept of fetal programming, very similar to metabolic imprinting, but the difference is metabolic imprinting is a nutrition after birth, right, the first few months after birth. Fetal program is the nutrition of the mother when this cow is, is pregnant, and what does it do to the calf later on? After the calf is born, what happens to the performance? 
So there's plenty of data showing that when you supplement calcium and legislation, you can actually change muscle development, adipose tissue, you win heavier calves, uh, you have better carcass quality. But what does it happen to the reproductive performance of the offspring when those cows receive supplementation or not? And then they also are affected, right? Because the reproductive axis is, uh, I mean, all the reproductive tissues, they also start, they all start developing, um, throughout gestation, okay? Mostly during the first uh, 130 days of gestation. They continue after that, but even early gestation, there's some indication that a change in the nutrition can actually change how these cells, how these follicles are being developed. Now, does that have implication on how they're gonna perform in the future? And it does, right? So those are the first two studies that uh, show that in beef cattle. Okay, people cite that a lot. This is boss Talos animals, okay? I'm gonna go to boss animals in a minute. And this is heifers that were born from cows that received or not protein supplementation uh, during the last trimester of gestation. So about 90 pounds of, of protein supplement per cow, and then they look at the performance of the heifers. So what they see is that overall, those heifers that are born from cows that received supplementation, they are heavier at weaning, okay? In one of those studies, they achieved puberty slightly earlier, and this is mostly because they're slightly heavier at weaning, okay? Now, in another study, no differences in age of puberty, but look at their pregnancy rates and the percentage of heifers pregnant in the first 21 days. It's a tremendous impact of that. So we're talking about, like I said, 90 pounds of feed in the mother, and look at the benefit that we have in their reproductive performance. So if you're looking for all, trying to be more efficient, right, new things that we can do, this is one. And this is just one benefit, right? What's the main goal of supplementing cows before calving? Make sure that they calve in better body condition. Uh, which is going to be better for their pregnancy rates, which is also better for the weaning weights of the calves, and there's also long-term consequence. So I, right now, I'm very excited about this type of topic. Uh, we have other data with, with, with males and what happens to progress quality immune system, but I think this is the, the thing to, to focus on from now on beef cattle. It's probably one of the newest things to focus. There's still a lot of things that we have to figure it out, but it's, there's no more efficient time to change their long-term performance than during gestation in the first few months after birth. There isn't, right? So I, I think we still have a lot of things to figure out. This is another study, okay, that they looked at supplementing the ciliary grains during late gestation. So what they see is at the time of weaning, heifers that were born from cows that received the ciliary, they were about 30 pounds heavier. But after weaning, they didn't see any differences in average daily gain. No differences in age of puberty, no difference in percentage of pubertal heifers. And again, this is most styles, okay? No differences in their follicular development, no differences in estrus response, but look at pregnancy rates to AI. 70 against uh, 33. So again, this is probably close to 100 pounds of feed that was given to the cows, and we more than double the pregnancy rates of those heifers this time in AI. I'm not sure there's any other nutritional strategies that can do that. Now, what about Bocinicus? Okay. If we have few studies looking at field programming and impact on heifer progeny performance in Bocinicus, we have even less in Bocinicus. I know some colleagues in Brazil that they are studying, so maybe next year or, or no more than two years, I'll have more data to share with you. So I'm going to share one study that was well designed, and then I think uh, um, it provides a good message here, okay? So this is a study that was in Brazil, and there were cows, or everybody on pasture, that they had cows, a group of cows that received protein supplementation before calving or not, or about one pound, one pound of soybean meal. After birth, after delivering the calves, the half of progeny, they had access to creep feeding or not, okay? So you have four possible combinations. Supplement the cows, no creep feeding, supplement with creep feeding, and so on, right? And then after um, weaning, they also provided some different, they sent to the feedlot or on pasture. But forget about this part here. Let's just focus on these first two. Prenatal nutrition and pre-weaning nutrition of those efforts. So what they see is at first, no interaction. If I provide a supplement before to the cows or and creep feeding to the heifers, didn't do anything, right? So what happened, now I'm gonna show you the separate effects. So the first one is supplementation of cows. Did it help those heifers or not? So what they see is in this study, no differences in weaning weights, no differences in their body weight, all the way to 26 months of age, no differences in puberty. So supplementing those cows, the lower cows, 
with one pound of soybean meal didn't do anything. What about the creep feeding? Well, those heifers that would have received creep feeding, they were about 15 pounds heavier at weaning, but that difference disappeared over time. All right, so no differences in puberty attainment. Now look at their pregnancy rates. In the first breeding season, 13% pregnancy rate. This is fine of pregnancy rates. And as a second, as a first cap count, how much they got pregnant. Horrible, right, the results. Now, does that mean the field programming doesn't happen in the Bosini? Because that's, that's exactly what you guys want to focus on now, all right? Because sometimes people take the wrong message when I show this. It's not, that doesn't mean that. It could be, we just don't know that yet. And why would I say this? Let's go back and look at the data more closely. Look at that weaning weights, 180 kilos. That's about 400 pounds. At 12 months of age to 14 months of age, they were 210 kilos. That's 500 pounds. 500 pounds at 12 months of age. Of course, you're only gonna have less than 20% of those heifers cycling. They didn't feed enough. Those heifers were less than 50% of their mature body weight at the start of the breeding season. So I can't draw any conclusions from the study that we have so far. I cannot tell if those heifers were actually imprinted or not with nutrition during pregnancy because they never fed them enough, right? So it's like, for example, you, you, you're assembling a car, it's two cars, all right? And one of them, you put a, put a regular engine and the other one, let's say you put a turbo, whatever you want to put, right? It makes it faster. And then when the car is ready, you, okay, let's go race. You don't put enough gas. So how are you going to see the differences between those two cars? That's what happens with nutrition during prenatal and post weaning nutrition, all right? There's still so many things that we, uh, we want to check. And unfortunately, I, I, most of the studies that I see, in my opinion, the heifers are not fed enough after birth, right? To really express what happened to them before. Now in both styles, they are expressing because, well, puberty attainment is not a concern on them. They have plenty of time to do it. With the both syndicals, we need to feed them more right before we make any decisions. So I don't want you guys to go home and think that this doesn't work for both syndicals influence cattle. It does. We just don't have the evidence yet. But in my opinion, it will. We just need a little bit more studies on that. Okay. So with that, that's all I wanted to share with you. And then we have about 15 minutes for questions, is that right? So, all right, does anybody have any questions for me and Shell, we will do questions from together. Yeah, then. Yeah. Do you think you would see any variational difference if you fed them at night instead of feeding them in the morning where you see that variation in the THI index in those groups? Uh, this is something that I wanted to, to do. But if I propose to the cattlemen in Florida to feed an eye, I'm going to get shot. Okay. It's not going to work. Okay. But thinking about just the physiology, right? I don't think it's going to work because it took them a long time. They, they accumulate heat a lot. So if you look at the graph, by 8 o'clock, they're still very hot. So it may may not work, but uh, realistically, I don't think anybody would have, even if it works. Yeah. But physiologically, it makes a lot of sense. Same idea is like splitting the amount of supplement, like feeding twice a day in the morning, afternoon. Same, same physiologically would work, but nobody would adopt, in my opinion. Any other questions? I know it's a lot of data. I can go back to some of those slides if you guys want to. Or was my accent so bad that you guys didn't understand? <laughs> yeah. On, on one of the studies, you said they used to concentrate. Was it a protein supplement or was it an energy supplement? Uh, which study are you? Uh, I can't remember. It was just one inside the concentrate. Was fed. Yeah. So all the studies that we are, all the studies that I showed you with the heifers are, is going to be energy uh, based supplements, right? So a lot of soy holes and uh, so it's mostly energy based. Did you expect the energy like a certain type of energy per, per day or was it just whatever was economic? No, it was strictly the amount that we have seen that it works for them to gain at least an, uh, close to a pound and a half a day. All right, so we have to provide 1.75 of a feed that has 75, 77% energy in the feed. Right? Because Bahia grass is very bad. 
And in July, best case scenario, 52% energy. By November, it's going to be 45. So it's horrible. We need we need a lot of supplement on those efforts. Because I, I was just thinking, if, if it's four to base, then you know we're trying to do something that's going to help with fiber digestion, but if we're overloading the room with more of an energy source, then that might kind of lower the digestion and affect it to some degree. Yeah, but that that's true. But there's a trend, right? At some point, we have to make a decision. Do I sacrifice the efficiency of forage digestion so that I can put enough energy in them to gain? Or am I just looking at decreasing the amount of supplement just to make them use the forage more efficiently? So for example, when we feed at 1%, like I showed you, get and gain 0.6 in average. So it's, it's hard, it's not gonna work. I need to push them and forget. The, the forage, it turns out to be more a source of effective fiber so they don't get disorders than anything. Any other questions? You guys want to talk about sports or something? We still have 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, just a question of thought. Uh, if you take a look at the uh, implanting of the stuff, that implant, and you look at briefly as a potential with those two coming together, we didn't talk about it in the study, but when those two come together to get us to the goal of that, then getting better pregnancy rate than those two come. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll answer first and then you, you correct me if, if, I'm, if I'm wrong. Um, in our experience, like for example, if your goal is to anticipate purity, right? Uh, accelerate puberty attainment, creep feeding is not enough. And I don't think that even if you implement, it's going to be enough. All right, there are some studies showing that creep feeding the animals you when you feed when they're young, like you provide that creep feeding starting at two to three months of age and you feed them for a long time during that window, right? You can actually change some of their gene expression later on in life. So it's slightly causes a metabolic imprinting. It was never enough to anticipate to, to hasten puberty attainment. The only time that we do see that feeding more at the beginning that they, their puberty is, is significantly changed is when they, they're early when they put on a high concentrate diet. So it seems that with the creep feeding, it helps, but they don't consume enough. They're just too young. They don't eat enough to cause changes in the brain and overeat that hasten puberty attainment. So in my opinion, even with the implant, I don't think it's gonna work. It's more of a long-term energy consumption, high energy consumption, rather than just you know single time points. And, that's my opinion, but like, like I said, there's no study on that, combining those. Can you guys hear me now? Okay. Um, I mean, I honestly don't really know of very, any, very many, if any, Indica studies that really looked at the implant um, strategies. Most of those studies are in more of the Taurus cattle. Um, so I think it'd be interesting just to see if there was any impacts there, since we know they respond differently to some of our hormones and we would be giving them some exogenous hormones. Um, so maybe there's an opportunity there to can, kind of continue some things. Um, in my mind, the creep feeding, I think it's interesting from a research standpoint, but it's really hard to pencil creep feeding out, right? It's generally, especially with feed prices, it's generally pretty expensive for us to provide that creep feed. Um, and even in New Mexico on some pretty drought stricken years, we were able to still see a nice body weight increase without providing that creep feed um, to those calves. Um, I didn't show the data, but we did a study where we actually uh, utilize the Cinevix, the implant, Im implanted heifers at weaning um, to look at a second strategy. And we actually had no positive influence on body weight gain in those heifers because they didn't have enough feed resources. So um, it certainly does say that those feed resources need to be there when you're utilizing those implants. Um, but to me, if those calves are still uh, with those cows, generally they have enough uh, protein and energy necessary for those implants to work effectively. Um, and to me, it's more cost efficient if we don't provide that additional uh, creep feed. Can you 
Right, so the question was, do we have enough observations in the long-term implant data that I showed? Um, at this point, um, I haven't gone back to it this year to update it. Um, I've been busy with some other studies. Uh, we're still a little low on end there, um, and I still wanna keep carrying that out. Um, if you actually look at that, we actually have a pretty low percentage. We're down to like 30% retention rate. Uh, we had some really tough drought years, um, hit those heifers and that research center uh, they do a really good job of selecting for fertility because they call anything if it doesn't get bred, whether it's on a research project or not, and whether we want them to keep them or not. Um, so I think we're still a little bit low there, um, but I still feel pretty optimistic about it. When I've looked at kind of some of the raw data and when I've updated it, we haven't seen any significant changes. Um, I certainly would like to do a lot larger study with even more heifers um, to really confirm that. Uh, we've had some criticisms in the end. And as you guys know, with pregnancy data, you need a lot of animals to do that. It's really hard to convince producers to implant their heifers sometimes. So if anybody wants to implant heifers, I'm on, <laughs> I'm on board, let me know. Uh, but I do think there's still uh, some questions we have there and I want to continue to look at that long-term data. Any other questions? Yes, Brian. Uh, are there any studies on on the on, sell, on the selection of cows for milk production, and how that will impact the development of the heifer and the female of puberty? Uh, so the question was, if there are any studies selecting cows for milk production and the impact on long-term heifer productivity? I know of one, Marce uh, Mario, but that was done, I think, in nineteen eighties something like that they seen that it does increase winning ways but no long-term performance all right but uh that's all i recall from that study it was a long time ago so i don't know if there's anybody i'm not aware of anybody doing that right now do you know anyone no i probably haven't done a thorough search for that but i think we're probably thinking about the same paper um there's not very many out there that really specifically look at that all right any other questions? Because if not, I guess we're in an hour. Is it our break right now? I don't have the program right now. Yes. All right. So thank you again, everybody, for coming. And uh, we'll be around. Thank you.